This interview features Natalia Korokova, a theoretical physics professor at the University of St. Andrews. We discuss what it takes to become a professor, the differences in education systems across Europe, and her favourite comfort food. Enjoy listening! You're listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I'm your host, Samuel Avery. Join us as we journey into the lives of St. Andrews academics, discovering their passions, inspirations, and motivations. So today on Insight, we are interviewing Professor Natalia Korokova. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So what are your positions here at St. Andrews? So um, I'm a professor in theoretical physics here, and hello to everybody. And I am doing research in the area of quantum optics and quantum information and doing teaching, obviously. Mm -hmm. And... You've got um, a bit of a circuitous route to St. Andrews. You've uh, been to a number of different countries, but what what was the path that led you here to St. Andrews, finally? Uh, So I have, my last position has been in Germany. And uh, at some point I was invited um, to come to St. Andrews to give a colloquium. And I really liked the place. Um, It was a very pleasant atmosphere here. It was feeling like a very pleasant atmosphere in the department. And when I landed, there are some open positions here, so I decided to apply. Excellent. And before Germany, you were in Russia and the Czech Republic? Yes, that's right. Can you tell us a bit about your research here? Initially, um, my research is quantum properties of light. And uh, it's a very general expression, but you can take it quite far in other areas. For example, at the moment, I'm doing quite a bit of research towards um, quantum technologies where you apply these very fundamental things like peculiar properties of uh, light beams. You you take them to applications as far as metrology, quantum communication, and um, sensing and imaging, and even atomic clock, which are to be used in space. So it's uh, very interesting in trying to combine a very fundamental aspects like all these mysterious puzzles from the quantum mechanics with... Um, or something which can be really useful in everyday life. So there's a lot of applications to this actually very theoretical subject. Then. Yes, sure. What is your favorite thing in or about your research then? I think it, it maybe sounds a little bit not adult, but I'm still puzzled by all these curiosities of quantum mechanics. And I just still li- like to see the, the things which, which are against our common sense that they exist and they work. And um, it's also a little bit of fascination back since my childhood that you, physics frees your mind and makes it... Um, so you can sort of perceive things in quite different context and it's quite wide um, scope of things. Um, so I don't know. I like physics in general because it's so unconventional and allows you to get crazy ideas and to get something practical out of it. So there's all these these puzzles in physics and there's so many perspectives on how to solve them. Um, What's one of the subjects that you then struggled with learning and puzzling through as a student when you were an undergraduate? Was it thermodynamics? Is it like meant like uh, just... uh, No, I actually hated electronics. (laughs) I like, but I liked the soldering process. I liked soldering the circuits, but otherwise, all this theoretical stuff around electronics, for some reason, I hated it. <laughs> so electronics, but you're you're past that now, and you don't need <laughs> yeah. to do too much of it. So, um, congratulations on your recent promotion to professor. Um, could you tell us a bit about how university researchers typically become professors, or what distinguishes professors from lecturers and doctors? I realize that's quite an open-ended question, so talk about your your own experience. Yes, sure. It's like, of course, kind of, it's for everybody is um, different. I think one, one maybe important thing is there are different levels um, of how you manage things. It's, you can be a brilliant scientist in, in the sense that you can understand very precisely your particular piece of subject, but I think to really... Um, to make a career in academia, you should be really able to 
embrace several areas to look for new ideas, to be able to, not to just focus on one particular thing, but um, to have um, like... Is it being able to make advancements in your own field by tying in research from other fields? As a large yes, part of, of course, this aspect as well. But even kind of if we don't speak now about going into disciplinary or looking kind of across the different projects, it's just a certain uh, certain ability be not to be not only detailed but to to be to be. <laughs> It might sound fun, funny, I don't know, to be general in the sense that you should, um, it's like there is this famous saying that sometimes you can't see the wood behind the trees. Mm -hmm. And I think um, to to do a career in academia is to be able to see different woods, if you wish, <laughs> and not to concentrate too much only on the trees. And this is one thing. And the other thing, it's of course purely on practical side, it's also being good at time management, being good in a... Uh, sorting things into high priority and not so high priority because it's unfortunately only 24 hours a day. And it's, of course, also a certain level of enthusiasm. If you don't like what you are doing, you will not be able to progress anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So there's there's a whole number of factors that help an academic move along in their career. So what size of research groups have you worked with in or during your career in academia? It has been different. Like, for example, when I have been working in Germany, I worked in a big experimental group as a theoretician, and I was at some point even leading um, a, a group of experimentalists. And what sort of size would that group be? Including students, I mean, including research students, it would be something probably like 30 people. 30 people. Right. But uh, when I have started my group here, I deliberately wanted to keep the size small because we are doing theory research and if I really want to be personally involved in research and not to do just the science management, uh, it really limits the size. Um, so I feel quite comfortable to work with like a couple of PhD students, a couple of postdocs. At the moment, I have one postdoc and two PhD students and a re um, research student, visiting research student, and it feels comfortable. I probably would like to extend maybe for another postdoc uh, or maybe another PhD student, but not much more than that. I really like to work in small kind of group to make it more interactive. Yeah, so if you have a smaller group, you're able to get more involved. Um, so are there any particularly noticeable differences in the way that undergraduate education is conducted in Eastern and Western Europe or here in Russia? Yes, definitely. Like I can maybe best compare between uh, Russia, Germany and Great Britain. And uh, I think that, uh, well, it's an interesting experience also in the sense that um, it was... <laughs> It was partially a cultural shock when I started to teach here after Germany and Russia. I think there is quite a lot of common approaches between Russia and Germany where you expect student to um, work quite a lot by himself or by themselves. In uh, Britain, in Britain it, I feel it's much more spoon-feeding required. And I think we are quite lucky in St. Andrews because in St. Andrews we have very good students, really. Uh, but even here, you encountered it so much. The students are not so... You you really need to cater for students, to provide for students. Whereas the mentality in Russia and Germany is, as a scientist, as a professor, I give you the best lecture I can, and it's your problem to get as much as you can out of it. It's not my problem to provide you notes, to provide you explanations, to provide you kind of particular citations from the book. My task is to subject you to the whole area of physics to specify what are the most important key points there, to explain you how we think about it, how we try to explore it, and it's your task what you do in order to learn it best. And I think it has positives and negatives. Uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of Germany in particular, I think students there are quite often overstretched so they have really to invest a lot of their own initiative. And if you are a good student, it's fine. But otherwise, you're much much more by yourself. Um, and So this is a positive and a negative. I still would wish the students here would be more proactive. Okay. And that they, not, they would be much more looking not how we pass the exams, but how we do learn the subject, how we learn how to study. 
I think the the blame is more or less on the British school system. And there maybe Britain could learn a bit more from Germany and even Russia. I think there is still... The, the, the education in Russia is probably not very uniform at the moment after all mm. these problems in, in economy and politics. But the best Russian schools are probably quite a good example of how you can do the education. I think students, the kids in British schools are too much spoon-fed as well. And also what is different is that, um, for example, if uh, in Russia, if you would have a student who is, uh, in principle, so a school student, for example, a school pupil, who is in principle studying quite well, but uh, is not managing particular areas of the subject, uh, teacher would really address the student and invent, uh, spend extra time with the student to get him to the certain level. Mm-hmm. And my feeling is not the case in Britain school, mm-hmm. British school. Here you would say, okay, everybody studies, everybody is individual. If he likes to learn at this speed, it's fine. If he likes to learn at this speed, it's fine. If he is reaching this milestone, it's fine. If he is not reaching it, it's fine. So this is my impression. And I think it does not necessarily does a good job. Okay. It's again has, um, there can be extremes, like for example, I know that in Germany uh, it's opposite, too much pressure on this, on, on as a learning mm-hmm. person, too much pressure to reach certain results. But here it would help, it would help because one of my biggest pain as a teacher and educator here is to see that so much, so many students here break at their studies, that we have as advisor of studies, I see so many students with all sorts of panic attacks, anxieties, depressions. And I think it's part of this relaxed approach. Okay. You are treated too softly for so long, and then you are facing the real life, <laughs> and okay, you are so not you, prepared. You think the step between high school and university is possibly too much in this country. Do you think possibly um, in Germany and Russia that lecturers and educators are less beholden to the students and parents of students? So. Here we have a lot of fantastic lecturers, and and I think that's agreed within the St Andrews community. But if and and that means they they take a lot of feedback on, and you know they they make improvements. Um, but if there is less sort of quote unquote spoon feeding or or leading on of a student to a particular text in other environments, do you think that the lecturers are less? Do you think that they're less beholden to the students, that the, the students have a, a few little no, no, no. influence I in think it's just changing like, their course? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. The, um, I wouldn't say that I have seen less of excellent lecturers in uh, Germany or in Russia than no, here. No, 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 I'm, I'm right? not trying to say that. I think the point is, what is the purpose of study? Okay. And I think in some sense, you might say in Britain is a little bit oriented at the result. I want to get my exam passed, I want to get my degree. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think in emphasis, for example, in Germany is a process. Mm-hmm. I want to learn how to learn. Okay. Right. It just means that uh, I can maybe uh, be more advanced in my lectures mm-hmm. in Germany. Um, students will be, and I can give more material to digest because mm-hmm. I don't need to spend time on, um, on things which students can understand themselves. Mm-hmm. Right? And it also prepares, I think, students in a way more for life because when you're working in a company or you're working elsewhere in the world, nobody will really kind of explain you everything to the very detail. Mm-hmm. You need vitally the skill to find information and skill yourself, right? Yeah, okay. And I think this is something which is missing here. And I think everybody in any country, the lecturers are interested uh, how how students perceive lectures and try to mm-hmm. um, give lectures which... Uh, students can digest yeah. uh-huh. it's just the question is where's the emphasis okay and do you feel that there are also significant differences in the way that research is carried out here in the UK and further west no I don't think or so I, I don't <laughs> oh so we won't, we won't talk about that um no, I think the, it's amazing that the university research is really, in this re- respect, absolutely international. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that it's any way much different if you, uh-huh. the research environment feels pretty much the same. Although there are some differences where I can say I really like it here in Scotland, right? In our, in particularly in our department. In Germany, there is a specific aspect that there are no such um, 
middleware positions like lecturers and readers. Mm -hmm. There are very few single positions, professorship positions, and nearly all of the other research positions are only temporary ones. Okay. Which results in a lot of psychological pressure for everybody yes, uh -huh. because it's extremely difficult to find a permanent place to work. Yes, uh -huh. so this is one of the major issues in academia generally. Yeah, and well, and in particular in, uh, in Germany, right? As mm -hmm. It's not by chance that we have so many German people here in the department as well. And I think um, that uh, it makes it... Uh, so it feels... Um, so you feel this pressure somehow, in, mm. even if you yourself is not pressurized. <laughs> if you have your position, you still feel this pressure because everybody is not really relaxed in this respect. Yes, okay. And uh, uh, in this, and the other aspect of uh, science here, it's I think it's more collegial in Britain. Mm -hmm. Although, although spontaneously, I wouldn't think about um, Britain as um, there are a lot of tradition and rules in Britain, right? Yes, but still, uh -huh. kind of. Despite this, it's very collegial in the in science in as university. It's more hierarchical in Germany and in Russia, in a way. It's still kind of probably even more hierarchical in Germany, uh -huh. and uh, this the, this is also a difference. So, so that's sort of a a, be a benefit for the UK then in sort of the more permanent positions for positions that are needed. Sure and um, sure. the sort of structure of management. But do you think there are any things that we should implement here from Germany or Russia in our academics? It's, again, more in the direction of education. I think from how students are educated, uh, one could implement more from what people are doing in okay. Russia and in Germany. And what I also like is that also final, final project work, final thesis, is more extended both in Russia and in Germany. Mm -hmm. And having only de facto three months of research project for your masters, I think it deprives you of certain things you could have learned. So, in Germany, for example, in yeah. Germany you do your diploma work, it's called diploma work, for one year. Okay. It's one year of full research. Mm -hmm. It means that nearly everybody ends up with some research papers in their hand when they are applying for PhD positions. And how much would the Germany um, degree start to finish take then? So if I wanted a master's and one of a year of that is the um, the diploma, then what what is the rest? It's a, it's it's slightly longer and it's not as fixed as here, mm -hmm. but it's generally probably like five six years. Five six years total. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's still not, not much more than our. Oh yeah, no no definitely. Uh huh. In Russia, it's fixed. In Russia, it's uh, either five or five and a half years, depending on the institution. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not then one year of research; it's half a year of research, of complete research. Mm -hmm. And um, also the PhDs. So, but but this this is again something which I think maybe Germany should take a little bit from UK. I found out that it's quite good that PhDs are limited, hard to three and a half, four years. Mm -hmm. It allows you really to bring things to the end. Mm -hmm. In Germany, PhDs are a bit more open-ended. Right, okay. So there is here you can't even do more than four years. You mm -hmm. are restricted. Whereas in Germany, there is no real restriction. You right, can, okay. I know people who are doing, who are good, but doing their PhDs for six, seven years. Right, wow, which is, yeah, a long time. They also get, they also get the better funding for that, I must say. Wow, well, yeah. At the I end guess. of their PhD. Yeah, you would need it if you were yeah, there for yeah, the, six so, years. So it's better funded, and at the end you normally get as much as you would get as a postdoc. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, it... it again, so there, there are differences to take into consideration, yeah, when people compare all these different systems. Um, so obviously after you, you ha finish your undergraduate degree, you have a few options. Would you recommend that students study and research physics in different countries um, as they progress through their career? I think, I think it's very useful because still, although I say that the research environment is very similar everywhere, mm -hmm. it's similar but still not the same. And I think it's very useful to see how the same things are done differently in other countries. Mm -hmm. It opens your horizon again. It, it's very useful research and also from my experience, um, uh, with working with other people, I, I see that people who have this international experience tend to be better in uh, organizing their teams, in uh, also kind of bridging different collaborations and so on. Mm -hmm. So if a, if a student does go to another country for um, like a, a postgraduate degree, then they will be coming with their own sort of cultural expectations of how work is carried out. 
but the supervisor that they will have will also have their cultural expectations. Is it a case that the the student bends to the master, or is it that the uh, the okay. two no, sort of no, compromise to get the most work or the most efficient work out of the PA? Again, unfortunately, in the world, everything happens. There are some situations where where this may happen, mm-hmm. but in general, but it's not a norm by no means. So, mm-hmm. in general, people will find um, some middle way and in this respect I also say it's when you are later in the position of a must <laughs> you will understand better the situations right um, I think one thing which probably will be difficult for a purely British student going elsewhere is that you will perceive a lot of people in a lot of countries to being much more direct <laughs> that people are used here yes we, we do love to beat about the bush um I also was getting some comments from my friends that they had to, when I came here, that they had to um, adjust to me thinking that I I am too direct and then did not necessarily notice it myself. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, yeah, moving on to some more general questions. Um, You are an advisor of studies to many students who go through the, the school. What would you recommend that students prioritize in their module choices? I think it's a little bit a combination and also depends a little bit um, what students want to do in future. In the first place, if you have a clear vision of your if you have a clear vision of your career, I would definitely um, orient to this. Mm-hmm. I would think what what will be useful. But even doing that, I would still monitor which so which courses are meant to be very interesting because you need not only suit your job, you need also to be a well-rounded person. Mm-hmm. And to get very good, very interesting courses to hear is not least important, right? So it's not only what you I need strictly for my career, but also what helps me to develop as a person. In terms of like looking at lecturers, uh, I, I don't think it's really... Well, at least in our department, it doesn't matter. Of mm-hmm. course, there are more inspirational lecturers and less inspirational lecturers. Mm-hmm. But uh, like in our department, I would say any lecturer gives a profession, uh, does a professional job. Mm-hmm. So uh, any lecture is of good quality. And this little add-on that some people are more charismatic and some are less charismatic mm-hmm. does not weigh as much. Yeah. It's just if you really don't have any clue what you want to do, it might be good to go to some more charismatic lectures to maybe sparkle something in you. <laughs> okay. So it's never too early to start planning for later in life, even yeah. when you're looking at modules. So um, how many languages do you speak? Well, I speak actively very good Russian, English and German. Mm-hmm. But uh, I also, uh, sp- well, in a way, I sort of half speak Czech. I was speaking Czech when I was living in Czech Republic. But because it has some correlations with some other, I also speak Belarusian. I was born in Minsk, and uh, it's Belarus. So I speak Belarusian and Russian. But now I'm getting problems with all these Slavonic languages like Czech, Belarusian, and Russian. So obviously I can speak actively Russian freely. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to other languages, which I understand due to my experience with Czech and Belarusian, I sometimes get muddled up from which language this particular word come. Mm. It means that if somebody talks to me in Czech, I would understand probably 90%. And if in Belarusian, um, 100%, maybe also like 80%, 80% if somebody is speaking Polish to me. But if I would start to respond, it may be a mixture of different languages. Yes, wow, I'm, I'm very impressed. I'm wild. Um, that's amazing. Is there another language you'd like to learn? I mean, not that you need it. It sounds like you've covered have, so many. Uh, I have a long-standing dream of learning French. French. Uh-huh. Even when I was kind of when I, I was a schoolgirl in our country, at those times you could learn only one foreign language mm-hmm. and, and I learned English. But uh, even despite of this, I asked my mom. I pleaded to my mother, and she arranged for me a f- one-year lessons of French when I was twelve. And I still remember some things from that. It was really we had really very good foreign language mm-hmm. education in Russia. But then, unfortunately, due to our financial situation, situation we had to drop that and since that I'm dreaming of learning French when my daughter started to learn French I said oh I will learn it with her <laughs> but now she dropped it <laughs> oh no oh tragic and uh, French obviously being quite a bit different from all the other ones there yeah um are there any countries that you would like to live in for your work 
You mean other than those where I have been? Or? Yeah, I guess. I mean, if you want to go back to one that you've already worked in. That'd be well, kind of, to be honest, in principle, uh, at some point, I would love to go back to Russia just in principle. Mm -hmm. Because when I left Russia, it was not, not for the sake of leaving Russia. It's just somehow my research developed this way that I mm -hmm. travel to all these countries. And I really love Russia and I'm really missing it. Uh, in terms of organization, Germany is definitely a very well-organized country. And uh, I probably uh, quite orthogonal to many other people. I don't want to go to America. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> Although I had a very positive experience with, I have visited America a couple of times and nothing, no, nothing bad to say about it, but I just feel it's not mine. Okay. So, so is going back to Russia sort of a, a bit of a patriotic thing then? If you would love to, to research in your home country? Well, it depends what you mean under patriotic. It's, of course, some personal relation because I like the country, I like mm -hmm. the people yes. there, and I feel at home there, and I still keep very good connection there. But also in terms of research, I must say, although there are a lot of difficulties which Russia is going through at the moment, um, visiting my... Uh, I did some research stays also in uh, Moscow. There mm -hmm. are still very good groups working there. And uh, in a way, I admire these people because they are working under extreme conditions, in a mm -hmm. way. Like, I, we have, for example, I visited one very prominent experimental quantum optics group. Um, it's amazing what the professor leading this group did because they basically had no support and only kind of negative... <laughs> they had support with negative signs. <laughs> from everywhere, but he still managed to gain the funding when they were given finally building for the uh, lab. They got basically a Saturn, um, uh, which was feel, uh, kind of up to the knees. It was filled with water. Oh, and wow. this kind of basically all the PhD students and the research fellows and the professor himself started with kind of removing the water, kind of doing the renovation, then building up the labs and so on and so forth. And when you talk to this to his PhD students, they're amazing people. They are so kind of confident in their research. They are so enthusiastic and uh, um, very 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 skilled and with a lot mm -hmm. of ideas and initiative. It's kind of very lively group. Mm -hmm. But they have went through extreme experience. And in this respect, uh, I think doing research in Russia may be also very interesting because. There are a lot of interesting people there, and people are more robust. In the <laughs> yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of interest, and there's a lot of uh, interesting people. You just need to remember your uh, waterproof trousers. Yeah, and yes. so by the way, like a, a comment to to this advising problems, I sometimes think that it's not necessarily good to to live always under very good conditions. You forget that mm. life is life. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's and quite, that is actually quite a good, good sentiment to take yeah. away. Yeah. And it, it is good. Uh, somehow you think that life should always avoid pain. Pain is part of life somehow. And be resilient to, to enjoy fighting the pain is also some good experience. This might be a politically incorrect statement. but <laughs> No, I, I, you know, I, I think many people would agree with you. Um, it is part of the parcel of life. So what, what do you think is the most beautiful place that you have lived in? Well, in terms of, you mean just uh, landscape? Yeah, okay. landscape, nature. Um. Well, I didn't I, I didn't live in uh, Prague, but I lived uh, when I worked in Czech Republic. I lived in Olomouc, which is also quite a beautiful city. But I was always somehow um, very inspired by Prague. Um, so I kind of had some research connections there. So I found Prague is a very beautiful city. And I must say I liked, somehow was quite lucky with places where I lived. Also in Germany it was... Um, it's, it was not spectacular as such as some like Swiss mountains or whatever, but it was just very be beautiful forest and rocks surroundings. Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed that. And I liked St. Andrews when I came here. Mm -hmm. I really liked it. And I was, I actually didn't plan to apply for St. Andrews before I came here because I thought, mm, just kind of. Small town, small yeah, small town, small Scotland, town. yeah. But when I came here, I found it's actually very beautiful as well. And uh, in terms of what I, I like, I'm, I'm impressed by nature. I'm impressed by some spectacular views, and I have seen a lot of them. I got up to Singapore one way oh, and wow. up to like America other way. Uh, so and I really enjoy looking at different landscapes. But in terms of where I would like to live mm -hmm. and what I perceive as like beauty, I want to see in front of me. I really like just. Normal beautiful forest, for example, something like Tensma Forest, <laughs> something mm. which I, which I also like, and uh, the sea is beautiful. I like to be yeah. at the seaside. I like to have, have the to sea agree, in front yeah. of me. Yeah. 
Are there any stereotypes about physicists that you think you fit or any stereotypes that you think you are the opposite of? I think I'm not quite, I do not quite fit the stereotype of a, a female physicist because as, uh, quite often when people meet me, they kind of recognize immediately that I'm somewhere from academia, but everybody says, oh, you probably literature, languages, something like this. Mm -hmm. And I think it's certain vision that uh, a woman working in physics should be quite a quite woman <laughs> in a way mm. that it's expecting more like male behavior and and so on from women which is quite a sad expectation which is very yeah. sad expectation and also like probably you don't also like looking at female physicists probably don't expect her to cook at home and do things like this right so it's sort of certain vision of uh, strange personality and i think I, I hope i don't quite fit into this mm -hmm. <laughs> So you subvert some of those expectations. Yeah, Excellent. I like to dress up. I like to cook dinner for my husband. And all these things. Excellent. Um, and do you have any hobbies that you enjoy doing? Well, I don't have much time for hobbies left. Yes. <laughs> I uh -huh. must say. I like nature, so I like um, doing some trips in nature. And also, um, we are kind of a religious family, so church plays quite an important role in our life. And we do also some volunteering work for the church as well. Mm -hmm. So how would you spend a free day relaxing? Would it just involve going out to Tentsmere Forest? Or? For example, yeah. yeah. Yeah, or going for a service somewhere, for a church service somewhere. Yeah. Are there any activities that you got up to in Russia or Germany or the Czech Republic that you can't do here anymore? I don't know if that's some specific type of Russian sport or... Uh, skiing, skiing or you know any of the stereotypical skiing. ones <laughs> skiing <laughs> what kind of in terms of like sports it's obviously what is very beautiful if you do cross country skiing mm. in Russia in a snowed in forest it's very beautiful but Scotland being notoriously bad <laughs> for cross country skiing um alternatively is there anything british that you know get up to and you really enjoy doing something very british hmm never thought about it if I would start to play golf, that would be some golf, very golf, British, yeah. <laughs> I don't really play golf. Um, what is British? I don't know what is British. I guess ha having the seas nearby is, is something well, that seas, is uh, uh, well, nice. Kind but, of, yeah, but sea exists but also I, elsewhere. Sea does <laughs> exist elsewhere, so uh, it's not quite British, but maybe St. Andrew specific. Maybe, maybe what I learned in my time living in Scotland is to ignore weather. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yes okay well that that is yeah the changeable winds of a scotland are a very distinctly uh, british thing okay so we're now going to move on to the quick fire round so you can rattle through these questions or you can spend some time expanding on your answer if you want uh, what is your favorite music genre and favorite song well i like classical music but I'm not very, in terms of modern music, I'm very illiterate. I still like some like pop and rock songs back from my time when I was a student from Russia. Uh, I'm subjected to music from my daughter, teenager daughter, but I don't really <laughs> like it. <laughs> so classical music would be the answer. Classical music. Is there a particular piece that stands out? Uh, the first concert uh, by Tchaikovsky. It's the first contract for piano and orchestra by Tchaikovsky, for example. Okay. Otherwise, piano music. I like piano music. I mean, who doesn't? You have to be a madman to not like piano music. Um, what's your favorite non-academic book? Oh, um, I think I'm really kind of absolute, absolute fitting in all the prejudice here. As a Russian person, I like Dostoevsky. <laughs> My favorite uh, also is Dostoevsky, but a part of this, I like very much science fiction. Mm, yes. Uh -huh. And from the English, uh, for like from the English writing authors, so my favorite sci science fiction writer is Ray Bradbury. And I like not only his uh, classical sci-fi stuff, but also the Dandelion Bind, which is a more philosophical piece. I don't know whether you ever read it. I, I can't say that I have. I've read uh, Fahrenheit 451, but I think that's the extent of my knowledge. Um, would you prefer to go to a poetry recital or a play? To poetry or to a play? Yeah. Well, it depends. I like both. <laughs> depends what's on. Um, what is your favorite comfort food? Comfort food? Yeah. Chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> Solid choice. Chocolate any, any and particular tea. tea and chocolate? chocolate. I like dark chocolate. Mm. And I don't like when it's too sweet. So dark chocolate. Dark chocolate. Also, kind sweet. of, it's even a joke that every old Russian people like tea and absolutely fitting this as well. <laughs> <laughs> what 
<laughs> what is your favorite style of food to eat? Is it like Italian or Chinese or do you still want Bavari uh, Bavarian food maybe? Well, I think Russian and Italian. Russian and Italian. Do you prefer to go to holiday in the heat or in the cold? You know, I think uh, for St. Andrews you need to invent two-season pizza, right? Instead of four-season pizza, because to me it feels like it's spring and autumn in terms of spring seasons. Spring and autumn, that's all and we And I get. like to have four seasons, therefore I always like to go somewhere hot in summer and somewhere cold in winter. <laughs> Take off all of the seasons. So, do you have a physics idol that you look up to? Not really, although it was a period in my life where I was very excited by Feynman personality. I read a lot of books about him and kind of also his own books about his life. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think that he's quite quite a person, quite a personality and quite um, quite an important figure in physics as well. But otherwise, I don't have really idols or something. Um, what is your favorite beach in St. Andrews? Beach. Um, so West Sands or East Sands or Castle Sands? I think East Sands. It is very nice, unless it's uh, May the 1st, in which case all the students will be <laughs> running into the sea at dawn. So um, to wrap up, this final question, you can take some time to answer. You've recently been promoted to professor. So what is it that you are now looking forward to in your career, whether that's in here or that's in another country in the future? At some point, I decided never to make plans where it will be geographically, because all my moves were not really predictable in the beginning. It all happened. It came over me, sort of. So I think I just will enjoy uh, doing my research. So I really now have time and possibility to try new new things. One of these new things is to try to bring my very fundamental research to some more applied things. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm for the first time working closely with a private company, which is a complete shock again, cultural shock. So you really learn to mm. think in a different way. And then the other thing which professors can finally allow themselves is to start to do more philosophical things. Uh, on the other kind of the other wing of my research plans is to work on some more philosophical questions in physics, and I'm doing it with my uh, collaborator in Germany, who is just retired um, um, professor. Uh, on uh, aspects of classical entanglement. And this is where where you can, can't say to any grant agency, it will be useful there or there. It's really something mm -hmm. fundamental and a little bit philosophical. And in a way, I think it's at some point you really try to collect your experiences from all bits of research you have done and try to do something general, something okay. which will contribute in principle our understanding on physics. Okay, so you, you have a bit more freedom to look out what you're passionate about, which is always fantastic. So um, thank you very much, Professor Natalia Korokova. Thank you. You've been listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I was your host, Samuel Lavery. Thanks to the wonderful academics of St. Andrews. Join us in the future as we learn more of the people making our education. This podcast was produced by myself and our podcast producer, Sabrina Keating. To find out more about the Physics Society and what we do, please find us on Facebook or Google St. Andrew's Physics Society for our website. Goodbye.